Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and it's uh, Monday, April 18th. Um, I've been away in New York City for several days on, on business, and uh, I wanted to uh, say it's nice to be back. Um, I appreciate the uh, emails we've been receiving, both the, the, the ones saying keep it up, but, but separately I've gotten some good technical information from some of you as well, and I really appreciate that. I wanted to talk about three things. The uh, first is the condition of reactors 1, 2, and 3. The second is the condition of the fuel pool in Unit 4. And the third is the monitoring of, of fish. Um, the, the first, the condition of reactors 1, 2, and 3, is actually as a result of several of you who sent me a, a really great link about the uh, uh, reactor parameters as measured by, uh, by TEPCO. Um, the first graph I want to look at is the pressure inside the reactor. Um, unit 1 is on the left, Unit 2 is in the middle, and Unit 3 is on the right. You'll look at those and you'll see there's no pressure inside of Unit 2 and inside of Unit 3. That's a good thing. That shows that uh, uh, the reactor itself is under no stress. There is pressure relatively high, 150 pounds, inside of Unit 1, and I don't know why. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that. But let's go over to the next slide, which, which begins to make this uh, a little bit curious. The, 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 the next graph is uh, Unit 1, 2, 3 again, but it's the temperature inside the reactors. If you look at Unit 3, the temperature is right at boiling, which is really great. Very low pressure, very low temperature. That's basically about the best they could hope for right now. But look at Unit 2. Unit 2 shows 300 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 150 uh, on the centigrade scale, um, inside Unit 2. That can't happen if it's water. There's a, in, in thermodynamics, there's this thing called the steam tables, and water at room pressure, which is zero on these charts, um, boils at 212. You can't have water or steam at 300 degrees when there's no extra pressure put on it. Well, what does that tell me? That tells me that, the, um, uh, that what they're measuring in Unit 2 is not water or steam at all. It's hot air or hot hydrogen. And that's a problem. Uh, it tells me that Unit 2 is not being cooled. Now, if you look at Unit 1, the temperatures are higher still, but the pressure in Unit 1, going back to the other graph, is high also. So it can have water inside it and, and still be water-cooled, but Unit 2 cannot. Now, we've talked about it before that Unit 2 has a hole in the bottom of it, so I guess we shouldn't be surprised that the pressure is zero, but we should be very concerned that we're exhausting hot gases out the top of that reactor. The last, uh, the, the last graph is a series, again, unit one, two, three, of the containment pressure. Now that's the box that the reactor is inside of. And, um, and that shows that uh, basically unit um, one and unit three have slight containment pressure, and unit two has no containment pressure. If you look at one and two, and three, there's two lines on one and three, there's only one on unit two, then that means there's no pressure at the bottom of the containment. We know that to be true because there's evidence of, a, of an explosion causing a leak. Um, so this graph clearly shows that Unit 2's uh, containment is leaking. The previous two graphs show that Unit 2 is not getting water inside the core. And I don't really think that the mainstream media has, uh, has really addressed that that unit, uh, unit 2 is, um, is the cause of all of this radioactive pollution out into the ocean because its containment doesn't have integrity and its reactor doesn't have integrity. So whatever water is going in the top is going out the bottom through the containment and into the uh, surrounding soils. Um, it's the biggest concern. Unit 3 seems to be out of the woods and Unit 1 is somewhere in between. Now I want to talk to you about the Unit 4 fuel pool. Um, on Friday, TEPCO had a release that said that uh, they had measured the water in the pool and they found that a little tiny cubic centimeter, about that big cubic centimeter, had um, 250 disintegrations per second of iodine. Now you'll remember that iodine is one of those fission products that break up. 
And uh, I believe that when you find iodine in a fuel pool, it's an indication that a fission reaction has occurred. Now, it can't have come from Unit 4 because Unit 4 has been shut down for five months unless a reaction occurred after the accident as a result of the accident. Now, I think TEPCO anticipated my argument, and they said, no, that's, that's not what happened. Um, the iodine fell from the sky from the explosions in Units 1, 2, and 3 called iodine deposition. Well, let's take TEPCO at its word. A little box this big has 250 disintegrations per second now, but the accident occurred 32 days ago. So that's eight, that's four half-lives. So if it's 250 now, it was 508 days ago, 1,008 days before that, and 2,008 days before that. So that little box, when these plants were exploding, had iodine fall into it to the tune of 2,000 disintegrations per second. Now, that little box is a centimeter by centimeter by centimeter. If we look at a cubic meter, there's going to be 100 by 100 by 100 of those little boxes, or a million of those little boxes in a cubic meter. So if we multiply that 2,000 by a million, we get 2,000 megabecquerels in a cubic meter. Well, that pool is the last piece of math here. That pool is 15 meters deep. So imagine these boxes stacked 15 high. So we take the 2,000 megabecquerels times 15, we get 30,000 megabecquerels in that column. Well, if we take TEPCO at its word, all of that fell from the top. That's a square meter. What that means is that the iodine deposition on a square meter was 30,000 megabecquerels. That's pushing the numbers at Chernobyl. So if we take TEPCO at its word, they had Chernobyl level releases on the other units, which caused the iodine to fall on unit, uh, on unit four. Now there's two other pieces of that though. Iodine is a gas. And I don't know how a gas falls from the sky in these kind of quantities and gets absorbed into a fuel pool. There's probably a thousand to one factor there too. And the last piece is, if we take TEPCO at its word that the iodine fell from the sky, unit one exploded first. Unit two exploded next. Unit three exploded next, sorry. And unit two exploded third. Unit four still had its roof on during all of those explosions. So it's hard to imagine iodine deposition getting into the fuel pool as a result of the explosions in units one, two, and three. But if we take TEPCO at its word, they have, they're claiming a, basically a Chernobyl level release. Then I'm saying that it could be that, or it could be that the fuel pool had a self-sustaining chain reaction. Last thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, was fish. Over the weekend, the FDA announced it would not be monitoring fish on the West Coast, and I don't think that's a good idea. If there's anything you can do uh, as a result of these videos, besides staying informed, and I appreciate that, um, it's to contact your congressperson and say, hey, you know, we're, we're citizens here. We deserve to have our fish monitored. I don't think we'll find anything initially, but over the next year as the um, little fish get eaten by bigger fish get eaten by bigger fish and the plume spreads, we might. And it just seems to be a prudent health, um, health uh, risk that can be avoided by proper monitoring. Well, thank you, and, and, and thank you for everyone for their emails, and for those of you who pushed the donate button, I also appreciate it. I'll get back to you as soon as I have other information to share. Thanks.